Well, this is it. We've been waiting 20 years to see these images, and now today we have finally seen them. We've got a deep field image seeing almost to the beginning of the universe. We've got an exoplanet spectra detecting its atmosphere. We've got colliding galaxies, the death of a star, and the birth of other stars. This is the new images from the James Webb Space Telescope. Hi everyone, I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy journalist for over 20 years, and I have been following this story for my entire career in space journalism. So it's great to be able to sit here and share these incredible first images. All right, let's get into them. The first image is a deep field image of a galaxy cluster called S Max 0723. And this is an image that has been taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. It's one of those places that Hubble has looked where there should be almost nothing in the sky. And yet, the more it looks, the more galaxies pop out. But the thing that's really important is that you've got this fairly large galaxy cluster sitting in the middle of the image. Now, the light from this galaxy cluster has been traveling to us for about 5 billion years, about as old as the solar system. But then around this image, you've got lots of other fainter galaxies that are farther and farther away. The redder they look, probably the farther away they are. And in many cases, you're seeing galaxies where the light has been traveling for over 13 billion years to reach us. But the part that's really amazing is you've got these little arcs that are all around, almost like a circle around this central galaxy cluster. And what this is, is gravitationally lensed galaxies. So this giant galaxy cluster is sitting in the foreground and it's acting like a natural telescope lens to show off the, the galaxies that are in the background. And in this case, those galaxies are just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang itself. It's probable that the first stars ever formed are in some of these galaxies. So it's important to put things into context here. Now, when Hubble did some of its deepest deep fields, it would do about three weeks of observations on one specific spot in the sky. And it gets even more complex than that, right? Hubble is orbiting around the Earth. Webb, out at the L2 Lagrange point, can do its observations in one contiguous go. And this is 12 and a half hours of exposure from Webb imaging this one region to be able to produce this image. And so not only is it a bigger, more sensitive telescope that's cooled down to be able to see these wavelengths that we just can't see with any other telescope, but it's a lot more convenient. It's able to just stare continuously at one target and then move on to the next target. And so it's a lot more productive of a science instrument than kind of any telescope we've ever seen before. Hubble's not the best comparison because Hubble, of course, is able to do near infrared, visible, ultraviolet. It's better to compare to another infrared telescope. In this case, we can compare the image of the same region from the WISE telescope compared to Webb. And you can just see the level of detail in the Webb image is just so far beyond. It's really amazing. From a scientific perspective, what's really amazing about Webb is that it can view the spectra of many galaxies all at the same time. It can do about 100 galaxies in a field of view and determine their chemical spectra. And what this is, this is the chemical fingerprint of the galaxy. It tells it the distance away to the galaxy, how fast it's receding away from us, but it also can tell you the chemical characteristics of that galaxy. And the astronomers working with Webb were just amazed that they can sense the individual molecules that are present inside those galaxies to know which ones are going through star formation, which ones have ended their star formation, which ones have recently collided, what kinds of heavier elements are being produced in these galaxies. Again, it's this view right to the earliest moments of the universe when all of the more complicated galaxies that we see today were starting to come together. The second image is of an exoplanet, and we're going to need to manage expectations here because I'm sure when you heard that Webb was going to take a picture of an exoplanet, you'd be seeing like another Earth. But 
we still don't have a telescope that is powerful enough to be able to see another Earth with any kind of clarity. The greatest telescope that we can imagine right now will show us nothing more than a single pixel. It'll be a really fascinating pixel, but still a single pixel. The target planet is called WASP 96b, and this is an exoplanet that's over a thousand light years away from us. Webb was able to watch as the planet was passing directly in front of its star. It was, a, it was a transit that took about six and a half hours long. And then they were able to take the chemical signature, the spectra of the atmosphere of this planet and work out what kinds of chemicals are in it. And once again, we get a sense of why this is such a dramatic increase from something like Hubble. Hubble can't do a six and a half hour continuous observation watching the entire transit of a planet because again, it's orbiting around the Earth. Sometimes its view is blocked by the Earth and so it can only make partial observations throughout the entire transit. Webb, far away from Earth, can just watch the entire transit. And so we got this incredibly detailed spectra of the atmosphere of WASP-96b. Analyzing the atmosphere of an exoplanet is something that's only just been done a couple of times before using other space telescopes. Spitzer, Hubble's been able to do it, but nothing like this. And to get this incredibly detailed chemical fingerprint of this planet is just in its infancy right now. Now, when you look at the spectra, what you're seeing is lines of absorption where various chemicals are absorbing the light coming from the planet's atmosphere. And the key ones, the ones that line up, are the presence of water vapor in the atmosphere of this planet. And so that tells the astronomers that it has clouds and that there's haze in the atmosphere of this planet. We also learned during the press conference that Webb will be doing observations within the solar system. So not only exoplanets, but we're actually get images of Mars and Jupiter and Saturn and so on. And in fact, they've already taken the images of Jupiter and they say they're incredible. One of the challenges in making Webb be able to do these kinds of solar system observations is whether it can track its target fast enough for fast moving targets like Jupiter. And so they're able to do these tests of Jupiter and they found that yes, indeed, it can actually track Jupiter and apparently the images are amazing, although they haven't shown us those yet. We should get those later on this week. The next image is of a dying star, a planetary nebula, and this is called the Southern Ring Nebula or NGC 3132. It's located about 2500 light years away. It's only visible from people in the Southern Hemisphere. Once again, this is an image that's been fairly well observed by Hubble. So we can do a comparison. We can see the Hubble version and we can see the web version. What you're looking at is what's called a planetary nebula. It is a star surrounded by rings of gas and dust. And so this is a star that was probably similar to our sun. And as it ran out of fuel in its core, it bloated up as a red giant. And then it shrunk back down again, leaving this outer shell of material that was then expanding outward. And then it did it again. It sent out another ring of material and then shrunk back down again. And it did this multiple times until it ran out of juice and then it just shrunk down to become a white dwarf at the center of the nebula. And so these expanding shells of stellar material are still continuing to go out into the cosmos and astronomers can take these and go backwards in time. The outermost shell is the one that was released earliest while the innermost one was released most recently. And they can see the different compositions of the material as the star was evolving into its final stages. And we actually got two images from Webb on this. And so with the second image, they were actually able to peer right down into the very heart of the nebula. And they found that no, it's not a single star that died that star was actually in a binary system. So it has a binary companion. You can see the dead white dwarf star, but you can also see the star that it was with. And so these two stars are orbiting around each other and they are kind of whipping up and changing the environment around them. And so it creates the shape of the planetary nebula through the interactions of these stars. As well, in this second image, you can see the blue regions. And so these actually are hydrocarbons that are being infused into this nebula material. And so over time, these 
shells of gas and dust are just going to continue expanding away and dissipate into the Milky Way. And so the hydrocarbons are then expanding outward into the galaxy, and they can seed other stellar nebula like the one that formed the sun and the planets. And this is how heavier elements can move from star system to star system, building up the more complex molecules that we find here on the Earth today. The next image is a fairly famous galaxy group called Stefan's Quintet. And it's made up of five galaxies, but it's actually made of four galaxies. The leftmost galaxy is only about 40 million light years away from us. So it's actually way closer. The rest of the galaxies are about 290 million light years away. This image is actually the largest image that Webb did. It's made up of 1000 separate exposures, which together fill up about one fifth of the area of the full moon on the sky. So you can see James Webb is a very detailed instrument. They described it as holding a grain of rice at the with your outstretched arm. And that's how much of the sky Webb is imaging each time. These four galaxies are definitely interacting with each other. And in this infrared view, you can see the tidal tails and the gas and dust that is streaming from one galaxy to the other, they've torn each other apart at a structural level. And you can see how this is having the impact. You've got regions of increased star formation. And in the topmost galaxy, so much material has actually gone into it, that the supermassive black hole at the heart of the galaxy has become active, it started to actively feed on this material and then blast out radiation in its environment. This galaxy group is very important. It is easy to see I've imaged it with a telescope before. So it's the kind of thing that amateur astronomers can see. But these kinds of interacting galaxies are a lot more rare in the universe today. Now that the universe is so stretched out. But in the early universe, when the universe was a lot more dense, these kinds of galactic interactions were happening a lot more commonly. And so to be able to study one up close, will give astronomers a good sense of what they're looking at when they see the ones that are 13 plus billion years old. And the last image, and I gotta say they did save the best for last. This is the Carina Nebula. It's a star forming region located about 7500 light years away. And this is a very well imaged nebula. We've seen pictures of it from the Hubble Space Telescope and many other telescopes. It's very famous. It's a very showy nebula. You know, if you remember the pillars of creation shown by the Hubble Space Telescope, this is the same kind of object. This is going to be Webb's version of the pillars of creation. So just to give you a sense here at the top of this image, you see a lot of really bright stars and this sort of blue nebulosity. And then down at the bottom of the image, you've got all of this redder material and nebula. And you can see this really crisp line between the top and the bottom. And what's happening is you've got these enormous blue hot stars that are more mature and are blowing out these intense flows of radiation. Now this radiation is sweeping down and striking the nebula material down at the lower part of the image and causing it to pile up and move like a cliff almost inside that nebula material with this compressed dense gas and dust, you've got newly forming stars forming in these knots inside. Because Webb is an infrared telescope, it can see through the gas and dust that would ob normally obscure our view to this material. And so astronomers have been able to see hundreds of new stars that they had not been able to see before in this nebula. And when you look at some of these features, they do seem kind of reminiscent of the pillars of creation. And it's the same function, you've got this really powerful stellar wind that's being blasted off these giant hot stars that is impacting where the stars are and blowing away this material. And so the big question is like, how long can these stars inside the nebula grow material until the radiation from their neighbors blasts it all away? What halts the star formation in these star forming regions? This is one of the most exciting instruments, one of the best ways that we're going to be able to find this out. All right, well, those were the five images that we got from Webb today. Absolutely stunning. I'm I'm excited to see what happens. Now this is just the beginning. 
We learned from NASA that the orbit that Webb was put on from the Ariane 5 launcher was so precise that it's probably going to be able to remain functional for about 20 years. And so this is just the beginning of this long journey. Astronomers haven't even had a chance to really digest the images that we're looking at. Each one is going to keep people busy probably for years. And yet, because it's so powerful, because it's so fast, because it can make these continuous observations, it's just going to keep funneling the science our way. In fact, the part that's kind of exciting is that we don't know what are going to be the biggest mysteries that Webb is going to unfold. Hubble's job was to help measure the expansion rate of the universe. Not only did it do that, but it helped learn that the expansion of the universe is accelerating thanks to dark energy. But then it did everything else. Imaged exoplanets, looked into nebula, peered at the vast distances of the universe, looked inside the solar system, turned up mysteries that we didn't even know, questions we didn't even know that we had. And Webb will do the same. So we don't even know what questions Webb is going to provide to us and help us search out the answers. Of course, we've done lots of information about Webb here on this channel. We did a half hour long deep dive into Webb, everything, the background of the telescope, what it's designed to do and how it's supposed to see it. Of course, before we'd seen the first images. So use that as a way to kind of inform what it is that you're looking at. I've done an interview with Dr. John Mather, the Nobel Prize winning scientist behind the Webb Space Telescope. He started this idea 25 years ago and was there on the unveiling of the images. Absolutely fascinating, wonderful guy to talk to. Again, a lot of really deep insights about Webb, but also the other ideas that he has for the future of astronomy. I did an interview with Lee Feinberg, who is the project manager for the Webb Space Telescope and again has overseen the telescope from the inception to today. And you get a lot more behind the scenes information about what it was like to go through it. And we'll put some more interviews that I've done in the description down below. All right, that is my first reaction to the images that we got from Webb today. I I'm still processing, still digesting, still learning about what it is that we saw. And I know that we're going to be getting many, many more images in the days to come. And hopefully I can help give you perspective about what it is that you're looking at. This was a special event. Obviously, we dropped everything to bring you this coverage, but we will be doing our regular news episode on Friday. So definitely come back then. And if you want more news, subscribe to my weekly email newsletter. Go to universetoday.com newsletter to sign up. All right, we'll see you on Friday.